Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Yoa, and um, with me on this call is um, the erudite um, scholar that we have in the building. His name Adedapo Adebayo. So they're just joining us. Welcome. Um, I think we're having little issues with some of our links. I think especially the one on Twitter. We try to fix it. But we go straight, uh, straight away into this session. It's going to be a very nice conversation. I will plug you to pay attention, to grab a lot of the information we're going to be sharing here today because um, this is going to be a bumper package. And so I start um, immediately. So data has um, become the most critical resource in the digital economy. However, with the digital economy accounting for 17.8% of the GDP, the value of personal, economic, social, and other data types will continue to surge. Um, regulating the use of personal data became critical for a number of reasons, which include the prevalence of transactional internet um, that has brought about rising violations of um, privacy rights by digital companies, and also the need for Nigerian businesses to show compliance with international data protection laws and uh, became really apparent. Um, on this conversation, like I said earlier, is um, Adida Kwade Bio, is the lead risk management audit and assurance of Vertebra. And my name is Benny Yoa. I lead brand and communications of Vertebra. Um, Mr. Dapo, can you quickly just give us an introduction of yourself? Well, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Adida Kwadibayo. I head the risk management um, function of Vatibra Limited. And, um, you know, Vatibra Limited is a, a, a tech company of choice that renders service across the continent of Africa. So by such doing, we, we take a leading role in terms of being a data controller and safe handling of data. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll quickly go to my first question to you. Um, and this question is, um, let's begin with this um, fact about um, your experience as a lead auditor and an implementer. Um, how has this impacted you thus far? Oh, well, you know, it's, it, um, quite an intriguing and a revealing experience. Let me take you back a bit. You know, Vatibra as an organization, we implemented an integrated management systems some years back. And um, the experience gathered during this phase, because one of the fundamental frameworks that we implemented then was the ISO 27001, which borders on information security management. Now, the experience gathered at this phase where I champion as a lead auditor, it has exposed us, the entire implementation team, to a whole level of responsibilities that are required in the aspect of data governance. And uh, I dare say that we are better positioned to, to meet up with the requirements of um, legislation regarding safe handling of data as of today, because uh, the IMS implementation made our systems resilient and robust, and we became very process driven, such that by the time the NDPR regulations was released in 2019, it gave us a whole lot of mileage. And um, as of today, we, we are better for it. Okay, so um, quickly to my next question. Um, why should you care about data and its management? What's that fundamental reason why we really need to care so much about data. Um, okay, let's look at it from this perspective. You know, there is hardly anything you do at this digital age that is not data driven because of the whole extent of digitization of processes that um, enable humanity to function from our education to our financial transaction, even to our healthcare. They are all driven 
by information systems. And each of these systems, they gather data. As of today, there are thousands, millions of nodes across the world where information is being gathered about you and I. And um, it becomes important that we should actually care about how such data is being handled, how is it being stored, because there are actually no barriers to movement of data in, in, in today's reality. From our devices to sensors, there are devices picking up your locations at different points in time. And this information are stored on computers across different parts of the world. And um, you and I do not even know where these computers are. We do not know the kind of um, safeguard that has been put in place. So it becomes very important to you and I to care about how our data is being handled by third parties and by service providers and our people we've entrusted our data with. And you know, data is a, is a thriving asset as in today's world. Like the cliche usually says, data is the, is the new oil. And by, by saying that, you should understand that there is a rich market. There is a market, an active market where people transact in data. There's an active market, there are active buyers, there are willing buyers for your personal data. So it becomes important for every one of us to, to have that sense of responsibility that you know what, this data I'm giving, I'm, I'm leaving out at this point in time, are there ethical conducts that, got, that governs how such data is being handled? So we typically play in the tech, um, in the tech world and um, the tech space today. Um, yeah. What is your take about the many areas of data manifestations and the need for data audits in this new digital age? You know, like you rightly said, we are in the tech age and um, there will always be an abundance of data for service providers and tech companies to work with. So there will always be a new a, a need to audit those data. One, to ensure data integrity. Of course, you have a need to audit such data, such that whatever data you are feeding into the system is accurate on one hand, then the data you've collected from your data subject, it is not tampered with in a, in a, in a malicious manner. If you've imputed at some point in your, let's say you are, in, you are exposed to a portal that is requesting for your date of birth, it should not change at some point. You know, the integrity of your data should be secured. And that's one of the reasons why you need to audit um, um, your data from time to time. Also in terms of um, protection and rights, you know, we have legislations all over the world now that has given fundamental rights to data subjects. So there is always need to carry out data protection audits to determine how well you are faring as an organization and how well you are complying with the requirements and protecting the rights of data subjects. Also, in terms of security, you also it's also important to audit the security framework around the data you've collected so, so that you will be able to assure and protect the confidentiality, the, the availability and the integrity of those data. It's quite important to have all of this in place. And of course, you know, it's it's becoming at this digital age. For this, for instance, in year 2022 alone, we've had series of instances where there has been data breach, even across top tech companies in the world. As recent as just last month in July, I, I guess about 5.4 million Twitter users were were exposed uh, by an external attack where somebody had access, you know, through hacking to to have access to their personal data. Now, this could be used in any malicious way. So auditing your system to ensure that you, you treat all vulnerabilities so that you do not fall into such attack. And it's, it's always very important. And there's a need for any uh, serious-minded organization, a responsible organization, an organization that prides itself to be a leader of tomorrow and wants to play in a leading role in the digital age. You should take data audits seriously. Thank you. Um, so um, you spoke earlier about um, the many areas of uh, data exposures. Uh, uh, so uh, this leads me to this next question, which is about 
um, data breach. Talking about da data breach, what are the yes. kinds of threats we face today in the world uh, where data is king? Well, I, I like the phrase you've actually applied in that question. You said where data is king, truly data is king, which means um, where the, when data is king, everyone is after the king, just like a chess game. So the threats will face, it depends on the perspective you want to look at it. If you're looking at it from the perspective of um, as a data subject, what happens when there's a breach on my data to whoever I've handled my entrusted my data with. Anything could happen from identity theft. Your identity could be cloned. Imagine if somebody have access to your BVN. I'm sure you actually maliciously and uh, you won't be comfortable with that because such could be used for malicious purpose, you know, frauds and what have you. Now, if let's say an organization's uh, information assets was breached and some info, uh, information regarding intellectual property found its way into the hand of competitors. Now, that is a very serious uh, issue. So those are the kind of threats that will happen when there's a breach. If you, 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 can't, you can't actually exhaust them. There are quite a lot of them. You talk of fraud that will happen when your, your personal data, your people can actually masquerade as you and uh, commit, trans, do transactions, execute transactions on your behalf without your authorization. Your confidential information could leak you people go to assess Medicare from uh, different parts of the world. You will actually not want your medical records to be uh, un unauthorizedly assessed by uh, un an unauthorized person because anything could happen. It could be used to blackmail you, and you know it's, it's something that you can't even want to. You won't want to quantify the the implications when such happen. Also. You could have instances where there were attack on some organizations' database, and um, their service was uh, maliciously brought down abruptly. Those are also issues of data breach. You know, you have denial of service happening at that instance. Also, very important again is the reputational damage it does to the organization. You and I, I'm sure, will deal with different financial organizations, and when you have an instance. If it's now a public knowledge that, oh, your bank has been hacked, you feel uncomfortable and your the kind of trust you have in treating, handling, conducting your transactions through such financial institution, you have to lean backward a bit. So it affects the reputation of an organization in that instance. Also, you have exposures in terms of litigation because when there's a data breach, the first thing that should come to mind of any organization is who are the impacted data subjects? Where are they in the world? In that part of the world where they are, what are the regulatory requirements? Because those are issues. You could be sanctioned. You could be subject to investigations because there are different laws in different parts of the world and it gives different rights and privileges to data subjects. So to even talk of also national security breach. So those are issues. And truly, we cannot really exhaust the threats that come with data breach. It's just it's something that nobody wishes to happen. But again, you just have to prepare and uh, ensure that such is not happen to your organization. So data protection audit, what is it all about? Why should an organization do an audit every 12 months? What is the significance? Okay, um, as it is today in, in the Nigerian space, it's, it's a regulatory requirement for organizations that process at least 2,000 um, data. You know, if you've, had, you've transacted data on at least 2,000 data subjects in a year, you are obliged to subject your process to a data protection audit. That is what the Nigerian Data Protection Regulations as of today requires. So it's, um, it's a regulatory requirement on one hand. Then again, there's also the aspect of self-appraisal to your level of exposure. Because as a responsible organization, you should be interested in understanding your maturity level as regards data governance. So even without being prompted, it's something that as an organization, you should take, impo take importantly and carrying out an audit of such importance every month is actually quite important and um, is something that it's it's very it's it's a right step in the right direction and also very very significant because 
appraising your level of exposure will prepare you against um, the kind of consequences that could happen if there are malicious attacks. Okay, so this, um, we, are, we, are, we are easily getting to the crux of this conversation. Um, yeah. So now, we'll quickly look at data governance. Um, it has, it's yet to say already. Just give us a brief on it before I get to my next question, which talks about NITDA and why we are having this conversation. Okay, okay, let me speak briefly to data governance. You know, data governance, um, you could look at it from different perspectives. Let me see from the background that um, technology has evolved over time. And where we are today, we didn't just wake up and found ourselves there. We moved from an era where we were heavily manual in, in the manual environment to some level of control digitization. Now to the extent of open APIs here and there and data is being exchanged at the twinkle of an eye in millions. So if there are no governance frameworks in place, you know, there will be chaos. And, and that's just the truth of it. There will be chaos. If you allow every individual to act in the way they feel protects just their own personal interest, the rights and privileges that are guaranteed to data subjects as a fundamental right will be trampled upon. So as on a global basis, there is always need to have that governance structure in place so that there will be check and balancing. Now within an organization, it's also very important to have a data governance framework because it helps you, it prepares you as an organization to understand your level of exposure and prepare your stakeholders, your stakeholders that are dealing with these data to act responsibly. It is in a government governance framework that you now have policies and procedures on ethical handling. Where there is no data governance, when there is no governance in place, there are no ethics, there are no rules, and of course, there will be no consequence. Truth is, in the world of today, that would be serious inequality to the less developed countries because our national security will be undermined. So many things will happen. People will use data maliciously and there will be no consequences. So data governance is quite very uh, significant and um, is actually the way to go. Thank you. So NITDA, Nigeria Data Protection Regulation 2019 implementation framework. Yeah. Why was this, this? What is this all about? Okay, um, the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation was um, passed in 2019, and um, that was um, almost before the lockdown, where there was heavy digitization in 2020. Now, what this uh, what this regulation did is that. Um, it brought some sanity to the space, permits me to, for lack of better words, to the, to, 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 the, to the digital space. Because prior to then, prior to the NDPR, there was no uh, other than maybe pieces of constitutional guarantees to, let's say, right to privacy. There is actually no separate laws that governs digital activities and rights to data privacy across the globe. So what the NDPR brought was I brought gov it brought sanity, it brought responsibility, uh, it brought um, rights to data subjects. So, and, um, and at that time, when uh, NDPR came to be, we, Nigeria became one of the countries that was uh, the first to, to domesticate the equivalent of the general data protection regulation, which is applicable in Europe. So as a nation, it shows that we, we are forward thinking because we need to be perceived as, as a safe digital space where the rights of data subjects are protected, you know, for people that are willing to do business with us as a people. So for organizations running businesses in Nigeria, it's a, it's a good thing because it gives that sense that you work within an environment where there is sanity and, and there are responsibilities and there are rights, guaranteed rights too. 
Okay, Liam, yeah, thank you, Radeda. So let's um, look at the guidelines on the use of personal, uh, personal data by public institutions. Um, this guideline mandates every public institution to appoint a data protection officer and a data, data protection compliance organization. Give us insights into how this is uh, enabled locally at Batiba. Okay, the guidelines, let me see that, uh, yes, the guidelines mandates public institutions to appoint data protection officers and data protection compliance organizations. Now, um, for organizations that process a minimum of 10,000 personal data annually, they are required to have a dedicated internalized data protection officer whose responsibilities are well spelled out in the NDPR framework. Fortunately, in Vaxibra, we fall within that category. And um, as a provider of choice in, in tech space, we, we have responded proactively to that requirement. We have a dedicated uh, data protection officer. And we did not even just stop at that. We've also gone as far as engaging the data protection compliance organization who have been um, a guide, a, a guidance and have helped us in developing uh, data policy, helping us to, on the, to further refine our process and also provide the audits uh, and reporting uh, services that are required by NDPR. So we've, as of today, we have actually done uh, audit filing up to date. If, as far as, as the current year, you can verify on the on Nigerian Data Protection Bureau portal. You see that Vasibra is well listed. So as an organization, we have met up with those requirements and uh, we are doing very well in that regard. So I can say for free that um, whatever personal data that resides within our custody is well protected and guaranteed. So let's look at the um, risk mitigation strategy. Data intensive project implementers should be mindful of some of the risk um, associated with threats to individual privacy. What are the local risk mitigation strategies deployed at Batiba? Oh, well, that's, um, I could mention, I could go on and on and on on that, but again, we may not really go into the nitty gritty, but let me say that, like I mentioned earlier, first and first, we have a data policy. Like I said earlier, is, is a mitigation strategy because with the policy, every data handler and um, our systems, when we build them, they are tailored to meet up with some minimal requirements to protect the sanctity of personal data that reside within our custody. For instance, issues of encryption key, they are aimed in our processes. Secure development is aimed in our processes. So we do not, we are not the tech organization that will build the solution and uh, there will be, that, that have inherent vulnerabilities. We've actually taken it a step further to actually make data protection policy, a culture within Vatibra. We've gone far ahead, so we are big on training all our staff, our stakeholders, and even our third parties who are at one point or the other, they interact with data. There are minimal expectations we've made of them. Even when we engage um, third parties on contract basis and there will be data exposure in that business, there are clauses that guarantees the rights of um, data subjects that guarantees, that imposes responsibilities of data protection. We've gone that extent in ensuring that we mitigate any instance of um, data breach in terms of, our, uh, in terms of our projects. So we've also identified rights of data subjects and applicable legislations because in Vatibra, for instance, we are not just a national player, we are a regional player and there are different laws across the regions where we play. So we've gone further in identifying those rights of data subjects across jurisdictions. And we are maintaining that our processes comply with each of those requirements. You know, we've also gone further to make sure that we obtain consent because one of the requirements of data regulation is that you 
have an opt-in consent from data subject before you actually process their data. And that is actually ending our processes, you know. So you can go all along into issues of um, um, other information security uh, mitigations that we've put in place. And also, we are ISO 27001 certified. What that means is that in terms of security over information assets, data is a subset of information. Okay, security, you? yes. Okay, are we together? Sorry about that. Um, I internet issues here, so I'm really, really sorry. So I um, actually stopped at um, one of my questions where I was asking you about um, the data manifestations. So I'll quickly go to this next question, and it's pretty simple. Um, okay. Let's look at um, one of the novelties of the NDFR, which is the, the Nigerian Data Framework, is the introduction of this DFCOs. Um, a DFCO uh, protection, compliance service, audit, and um, training for data controllers. How does this work this in global sphere? When you take it to the external world, is this a global best practice? Okay, um, this is, you know, across the world, we have different um, regulations. You know? But fortunately, in our own jurisdiction in Nigeria, the NDP, the NDPR has created um, data protection certification organizations. And uh, if you look deeply into the framework, the framework has gone further to identify and translate uh, uh, the rules and responsibility of these parties, which include the, um, the DPCOs. Now, the DPCOs, these are licensed entities with expertise on issues of um, data governance and um, on legal requirements and issues of rights. So they've been licensed. Also, they have the expertise on, um, on data protection. And this, these DPCOs have been mandated to carry out capacity building, you know, capacity building for organizations that manage data so that they are, the DPCOs are the ones that will now guide those organizations from a maturity level of zero to a higher maturity level. See you they build in-house capacity. So they provide those, um, and you know, one of the requirements of, um, DP, of um, the data protection regulation is that it is required to do what you call um, like, like an oversight enforcement. Now what the body charge, charge with that responsibility has done is that rather than go personally to be doing enforcement per organization, which will not be efficient. They've actually appointed DPCOs that will actually do enforcement and supervision on behalf of the Nigerian Data Protection Bureau. And these agencies will in turn report their findings to the Protection Bureau. So it's, 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 that is actually the fulcrum of the role um, the DPCOs play in, 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 in data governance space. So, um, Dr. can you hear me? Of course, very well. Hello, I can hear you very well. Hello, Dr. can you hear me? Very well, I can. Okay, so um, the telekinetic move into the field and um, let us into the prospects with regards to data for particular. What's the prospect? Okay, the future of data, like we've actually mentioned previously in the session is that data is king 
and data is new oil, we need not to rehash that entire statement over and over again. The future of data is that so many products and services in future will rely on advanced analytics, which will be built, uh, the algorithms will be built on input data that will be, uh, uh, that will be mined from different sources. So the future is that there will always be need and there will always be much more demand for data. However, in going that, in, in looking at that responsibility also brings the issue of ethics will also come to play because in the future, there will be reason for people to maliciously obtain data. And then there will be need to also do more of uh, enforcement and then uh, probably to harmonize legislations. For instance, as, as a finance person, we've moved from an environment where financial reporting standards were localized to different countries. Nigeria has its own standards, the Ghana has its own standard, the USA, the UK. We've moved, we've transited to an environment where you now have international financial reporting standards. So in the future of data protection, we we'll also have a global legislation that will harmonize data requirements because data has no barrier. And um, limiting the legislation guiding data protection to a particular country adds some limiting effects and it gives, uh, it makes it difficult for data controllers and data processors to actually uh, prepare and uh, prepare a, a, a compliance framework to comply with regulations for all over the world because your data obtained in Nigeria may not likely be sitting in Nigeria. It may be hosted somewhere in Dubai or in, um, in the USA. So data is fluid. It moves between people and I. So it's actually important that the future of data protection is that we should have an harmonized law that governs uh, the use and the treatment of data across the globe. Thank you. So thanks to all the audience who have been faithful with us on this conversation. If you do have any questions, please. Um, send a question in the chat room and we're going to take it. Um, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask this um, very concluding question now, which is um, recently Vatiba achieved a major milestone in the, um, the Nigerian data protection audit and regulation uh, by getting audited. Can you just explain what that is, the implication for business, the implication for the organization? Yeah, fine. Thank you. The, the implication for that on on the for me, it's yeah, it's a win for the organization. But most importantly, it's actually a win for our clients and it's a win for users of our client services. The implication means that if you interface with any of our solutions and you are required to drop your data, being a compliant organization means that your data will be held in the highest of ethical standards. We will be processing your data in line with ethical requirements. For instance, there are, there are white-listed countries which you can actually exchange data with. So you are dealing with... is also gone further to ensure to obtain the ISO 27001, which governs uh, information security. So we're actually big on security of information. And so when you have your data with us, you are also uh, be rest assured that we, would, we are not the kind of organization that will maliciously uh, harvest your contacts and use the obituary in a, in a WhatsApp. It's been really well. Thirty minutes of this conversation, and I sincerely thank you for your time. Uh, to the audience watching, whether you're watching on Facebook, whether you later watch this on YouTube, uh, we're going to also put this on YouTube for people to have some kind of grasp on this subject. And um, if you're actually live on this call, we thank you all for participating. I'm sad we didn't get any question from the house. Um, and we're going to call it a wrap right now. So thank you, Adidas. Do you have any parting words? 
Yeah, you know, thank you very much for your time, Ben. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'd just like to say that as we as we pass this uh, session, we all should go about our business and be data conscious. You know, we we live in an age where we interact with so many solutions, and you always see consent statement and privacy policies. So please do well in reading them before you agree. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it's a wrap from us here at Vatiba. I'll quickly do a preamble, so, uh, preamble on Vatiba. Vatiba is a software company. Um, we pride ourselves as one of the top most in the continent of Africa, where we deliver all kinds of software solutions from um, customized portal solutions. And we've been on for about 20 years in the business. So if you are listening to us um, right now and you feel that you have a call for us, just check out our uh, Check us on Google or check us on www.vatibra.com or you can actually send an email to info at vatibra.com. Thank you for being part of this and God bless you. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye.